Part 2, Propositions 6 to 10 of The Ethics by Spinoza. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsberg, Texas, USA. The Ethics by Benedict de Spinoza, translated by R. H. M. Elwes, Part Two, Propositions, Six to Ten. Proposition Six: The modes of any given attribute are caused by God, in so far as He is considered through the attribute of which they are modes, and not in so far as He is considered through any other attributes. Proof. Each attribute is conceived through itself, without any other. Part 1, Proposition 10. Wherefore, the modes of each attribute involve the conception of that attribute, but not of any other. Thus, Part 1, Axiom 4, they are caused by God, only in so far as he is considered through the attribute whose modes they are, and not in so far as he is considered through any other. Quaderat demonstrandum. Corollary. Hence the actual being of things, which are not modes of thought, does not follow from the divine nature, because that nature has prior knowledge of the things. Things represented in ideas follow, and are derived from their particular attribute in the same manner and with the same necessity as ideas follow, according to what we have shown, from the attribute of thought. Proposition 7. The order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. Proof. This proposition is evident from Part 1, Axiom 4, for the idea of everything that is caused depends on a knowledge of the cause whereof it is an effect. Corollary. Hence, God's power of thinking is equal to his realized power of action. That is, whatsoever follows from the infinite nature of God in the world of extension, formaliter follows without exception in the same order and connection from the idea of God in the world of thought. Objective. Note. Before going any further, I wish to recall to mind what has been pointed out above, namely that whatsoever can be perceived by the infinite intellect as constituting the essence of substance belongs altogether only to one substance. Consequently, substance, thinking, and substance extended are one and the same substance, comprehended now through one attribute, now through the other. So also a mode of extension and the idea of that mode are one and the same thing, though expressed in two ways. This truth seems to have been dimly recognized by those Jews who maintain that God, God's intellect and the things understood by God are identical. For instance, a circle existing in nature and the idea of a circle existing, which is also in God, are one and the same thing displayed through different attributes. Thus, whether we conceive nature under the attribute of extension, or under the attribute of thought, or under any other attribute, we shall find the same order, or one and the same chain of causes, that is, the same things following in either case. I said that God is the cause of an idea, for instance, of the idea of a circle, in so far as he is a thinking thing, and of a circle, in so far as he is an extended thing, simply because the actual being of the idea of a circle can only be perceived as a proximate cause through another mode of thinking, 
and that again through another, and so on to infinity, so that, so long as we consider things as modes of thinking, we must explain the order of the whole of nature, or the whole chain of causes, through the attribute of thought only. And in so far as we consider things as modes of extension, we must explain the order of the whole of nature through the attributes of extension only, and so on in the case of the other attributes. Wherefore, of things as they are in themselves, God is really the cause, inasmuch as he consists of infinite attributes. I cannot for the present explain my meaning more clearly. Proposition 8. The ideas of particular things, or of modes, that do not exist, must be comprehended in the infinite idea of God, in the same way as the formal essences of particular things, or modes, are contained in the attributes of God. Proof. This proposition is evident from the last. It is understood more clearly from the preceding note. Corollary. Hence, so long as particular things do not exist, except in so far as they are comprehended in the attributes of God, their representations in thought or ideas do not exist, except in so far as the infinite idea of God exists. And when particular things are said to exist, not only in so far as they are involved in the attributes of God, but also in so far as they are said to continue, their ideas will also involve existence, through which they are said to continue. Note, if anyone desires an example to throw more light on this question, I shall, I fear, not be able to give him any, which adequately explains the thing of which I here speak, inasmuch as it is unique. However, I will endeavor to illustrate it as far as possible. The nature of a circle is such that if any number of straight lines intersect within it, the rectangles formed by their segments will be equal to one another. Thus, infinite equal rectangles are contained in a circle. Yet none of these rectangles can be said to exist except in so far as the circle exists. Nor can the idea of any of these rectangles be said to exist except in so far as they are comprehended in the idea of the circle. Let us grant that from this infinite number of rectangles, two only exist. The ideas of these two not only exist in so far as they are contained in the idea of the circle, but also as they involve the existence of those rectangles. Wherefore, they are distinguished from the remaining ideas of the remaining rectangles. Proposition 9. The idea of an individual thing actually existing is caused by God not in so far as he is infinite, but in so far as he is considered as affected by another idea of a thing actually existing, of which he is the cause, in so far as he is affected by a third idea, and so on to infinity. Proof the idea of an individual thing actually existing is an individual mode of thinking and is distinct from other modes by the corollary and note to Proposition 8 of this part. Thus, by Proposition 6 of this part, it is caused by God, insofar only as he is a thinking thing, but not by Proposition 28 of Part 1, insofar as he is a thing thinking absolutely, only insofar as he is considered as affected by another mode of thinking, and he is the cause of this latter, as being affected by a third, and so on, to infinity. Now, the order and connection of ideas is, by Proposition 7 of this book, the same as the order and connection of causes. Therefore, of a given individual idea, another individual idea, or God, 
in so far as he is considered as modified by that idea, is the cause. And of this second idea, God is the cause, in so far as he is affected by another idea, and so on to infinity. Quaderat demonstrandum. Corollary. Whatsoever takes place in the individual object of an idea, the knowledge thereof is in God, in so far only as he has the idea of the object. Proof. Whatsoever takes place in the object of any idea, its idea is in God, by proposition three of this part, not in so far as he is infinite, but in so far as he is affected by another idea of an individual thing, by the last proposition, but by proposition seven of this part, the order and connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things. The knowledge, therefore, of that which takes place in any individual object will be in God, in so far only as he has the idea of that object. Quaderat demonstrandum. Proposition 10. The being of substance does not appertain to the essence of man. In other words, substance does not constitute the actual being, footnote 2, of man. 2. Forma Proof The being of substance involves necessary existence, part 1, proposition 7. If, therefore, the being of substance appertains to the essence of man, substance being granted, man would necessarily be granted also. Part 2. Definition 2. And, consequently, man would necessarily exist, which is absurd. Part 2. Axiom 1. Therefore, etc. Quaderat demonstrandum. Note, this proposition may also be proved from Part 1, Proposition 5, in which it is shown that there cannot be two substances of the same nature. For as there may be many men, the being of substance is not that which constitutes the actual being of man. Again, the proposition is evident from the other properties of substance namely that substance is in its nature infinite, immutable, indivisible, etc., as any one may see for himself. Corollary. Hence it follows that the essence of man is constituted by certain modifications of the attributes of God. For, by the last proposition, the being of substance does not belong to the essence of man. That essence, therefore, by part 1, proposition 15, is something which is in God, and which without God can neither be nor be conceived, whether it be a modification. Part 1, proposition 25, corollary. Or a mode which expresses God's nature in a certain conditioned manner. Note. Everyone must surely admit that nothing can be or be conceived without God. All men agree that God is the one and only cause of all things, both of their essence and of their existence. That is, God is not only the cause of things in respect to their being made, secundum fieri, but also in respect to their being, secundum esse. At the same time, many assert that that, without which a thing cannot be nor be conceived, belongs to the essence of that thing. Wherefore, they believe that either the nature of God appertains to the essence of created things, or else that created things can be or be conceived without God, or else, as is more probably the case, they hold inconsistent doctrines. 
I think the cause for such confusion is mainly that they do not keep to the proper order of philosophic thinking. The nature of God, which should be reflected on first, inasmuch as it is prior both in the order of knowledge and the order of nature, they have taken to be last in the order of knowledge, and have put into the first place what they call the objects of sensation. Hence, while they are considering natural phenomena, they give no attention at all to the divine nature, and when afterwards they apply their mind to the study of the divine nature, they are quite unable to bear in mind the first hypotheses with which they have overlaid the knowledge of natural phenomena, inasmuch as such hypotheses are no help towards understanding the divine nature so that it is hardly to be wondered at that these persons contradict themselves freely. However, I pass over this point. My intention here was only to give a reason for not saying that that without which a thing cannot be or be conceived belongs to the essence of that thing. Individual things cannot be or be conceived without God, yet God does not appertain to their essence. I said that I considered as belonging to the essence of a thing that which being given, the thing is necessarily given also, and which being removed, the thing is necessarily removed also, or that without which the thing, and which itself without the thing, can neither be nor be conceived. Part 2, Definition 2 End of Part 2, Propositions 6 to 10 Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsburg, Texas, USA